Last time he was on the stage, it was for Pengburn Philosophy's event in conversation with Richard Dawkins, and he was such a rock star that we simply had to have him back. He's the former president of the atheist community of Austin. He is the host of a live access ca cable television show called The Atheist Experience that has developed a strong online following. He was raised as a Southern Baptist and spent years training to become a minister. It is that very study that has led him to his new path of seeking to believe as many true things as possible and as few false things as possible. He is also an outstanding magician, as you will see later this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Dillahunty. Hey. All right. Hey. Ah. Hey. This is, uh, is kind of like my second home now. Uh, I just keep coming back. Uh, November 6th, I was here with Richard Dawkins, and that's two days before the election, and I predicted that there's no way Donald Trump would win. Uh, let's, say, let's just say that uh, when I make predictions later this evening, well, hopefully they'll be a little more accurate than that. Uh, I am incredibly thrilled. I, I'm, I'm pleased to be here on behalf of uh, Pangburn Philosophy and, and love the way that they've treated me, the way these events have gone. I'm, I'm happy to be here with all of you. I hope you enjoy yourselves. But it's a special night for me because there are a number of people in the secular community and in the magic community that I have admired for many years. I, I don't tend to get starstruck anymore. Uh, fortunately, I've, I've become friends with many of the people that I greatly admired. And most of the time, it's turned out to be a wonderful thing that I admired them. They were incredibly deserving. When I was a kid, I started doing magic. And I loved it. And I remember watching magic on TV. My first introduction to my the person I'm happy to share a stage with tonight was on Happy Days, um, where, where he came in to basically perform a magic show and say Fonzie, but it, that just kind of stuck in my head. And many years later, as I found my way uh, out, even before I found my way out of my religious beliefs, when I found my way into developing under, an understanding of skepticism about how to think more clearly about the world, about how to understand it, this man was at the forefront of everything, everywhere I looked. It's like, hey, what's this skepticism stuff? And it's, oh my gosh, it's, you know, here's James Randi, James Randi, James Randi, James Randi, James Randi, one of the greatest magicians, performers, escape artists, thinkers ever. And everywhere I looked, it was James Randi, James Randi. And all these years, we, we had met exactly one time at the Amazing Meeting 7. Uh, my wife and I went to Las Vegas. And it's been on my list to sit down and have a conversation with him for all those years. We did that a little this afternoon. We're going to continue it here for you tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, James, the amazing Randy. Thank you, sir. Very good introduction. Thank you. Okay, my work's done. <laughs> How oh, are you, first of all? <laughs> yes? How are you? About this, like, just like this. That wide, that, that tall? That's about how much I am. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm doing very well, thank you, for 88. And I, when they ask me my age, I say 88 going on 100 because I'm an op optimist, to say the least. Eight, you're 88. I'm 48 as of Friday. Uh, so you're only like 15 years older than me or something like that. Something like that. Will my beard eventually get to be that long or is, this, is it stuck? No, you gotta pray over it. You gotta rub it, rub a little horseshit in there too. You know, just, just a little bit for fertilizer. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, I thought one of the best ways to start because we, we build this not only as Conjure the Night but a discussion about magic and skepticism, something, oh, two things we are both incredibly passionate about. Uh, I'm passionate about it primarily because of you and one of the things I mentioned to, to Randy today is I used to write occasionally for a, a website called Useless Knowledge. Don't try and find it, it's awful. Uh, basically anybody could write whatever they wanted and it was frustrating me to see people write things uh, about all sorts of woo claims that I knew that they hadn't been able to demonstrate. So I wrote something and one of my eternal thrills in life is that Randy in the Swift Report 
had seen that and quoted it and wrote something to the effect of, Matt Dillahunty gets it. And that was, that was it, I was done. I'm now the, I'm a master skeptic, I have been approved by James Randi, and now I will tell you all what I think. But I think it's worthwhile to give your definition of skepticism and make everybody aware, I'm, I'm assuming a great many people in the audience already know, what the hell is skepticism and why should we care about it? Let me tell you what it is not. It is not uh, cynicism. You can be skeptical uh, about anything you wish to be skeptical about as long as you've got good reason for it. But don't get cynical. That's a different thing altogether. Look them up in Webster's or whatever dictionary you use and you'll see the difference. It's, it's a, a tenuous difference, really, but it is important. And I am a skeptic. I died in the wool and the whole thing. And I, I started at that age. I went to Sunday school. That did it. <laughs> because I started to ask questions and they didn't have answers. They said, it's in the Bible. And I thought, who wrote that? Oh, well, Luke and John. And they, wait a minute, you said God wrote that earlier. Uh, yes, well, he did. But he did it through Luke and John and Matthew and a few other. That didn't sound right to me. What does he do? He stands in the clouds there and says, talk about this. You know, I, I doubt that. And I got very cynical. In fact, I only went to Sunday school for two weeks. As a matter of fact, the wonderful thing. I've got you I, beat there. I went to Sunday school for a lot more than two weeks. <laughs> I imagine, yeah. But I must say, and this is a confession now. I was given by my father 25 cents to put on the, the plate. <laughs> and uh, I did a rapid calculation in my juvenile brain. I was about 11 or 12, I guess, at the time. <laughs> I found out that Purdy's Drugstore up on Bayview Avenue in Toronto, in Leaside, Toronto, Canada, they had ice cream sundaes that were either 20 or 25 cents, and for 25 cents, you got two flavors. <laughs> and my friend Gary Haynes, he only got 20 cents a week as an allowance, and so he could only get a 20 cent one, and it was much smaller too. And I, I, I sort of lorded that over Gary, and, uh, but soon his, his allowance went up, and he got 30 cents. Well, it, it's a long story. It's sad in the long run because he, <laughs> He stayed at 30 cents and I stayed at 25, you see. And that wasn't really my allowance, that was what was supposed to go onto the plate. But I didn't go back to St. Cuthbert's Church for more than three weeks. And they, they finally sent a note home saying that I was not welcome in Sunday school because I disturbed everybody. I thought, I thought, they, were gonna, I thought they were gonna send a note home saying you owe us 75 cents. <laughs> I never told them. So, it's true, I mean, there, are, there is a lot of confusion where people think that skepticism is cynicism. No. And I think the thing that you, you taught me more than anybody is that skepticism, when, we're, when you're doing the tests, which we'll get to talk, talk about a little bit later, you're not trying to debunk. Everybody keeps saying skeptics are debunkers, and that's just nonsense. No. It's explaining. It's explaining. It's giving a, a proper solution or a more logical, likely solution for what has happened. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to expose magic tricks and such. No, we don't recommend that at all. But when a religious uh, preacher is out there claiming something or other, uh, it, it's okay to stand up and say, what's your evidence for that? If he says Matthew or Luke or John or something like that, say, well, wait a minute, no, haven't you got anything better than that? And if he says no, you turn around and walk out. And you'd be surprised, I've done this many times, you'd be surprised how many other people get up and say, yeah, he's right. You know, they stand up and walk out, and preachers really don't like that much because they're not gonna, these people are not going to put something on the collection plate when it comes around, you see. So uh, cynical, never. Don't be cynical. That's a destructive attitude to have, really. So it, it, it raises a question. Um, you very early on gained an interest in magic and an interest in skepticism. When, when you were doing it, obviously there were magicians 
Was there a skeptics community then? Did, did a skeptics no, community exist? Not that, I, not that I knew of. Of course, years afterwards, I discovered that all over the United States and in Canada, uh, to my surprise, there were some very well-developed organizations of skeptics and, and people who doubted these things uh, honestly and, and rationally and, and sensibly, not, to, uh, not screaming at anybody or anything like that, just uh, reasoning it out as best as they could and not finding very much success in coming up with any actual evidence. But I found out they're spread all over the place and then they started to come together and different states in the United States and different provinces here in Canada. I remember several of them, as a matter of fact. I wasn't living in Canada by that time. I was either in Europe or in the United States. But I found out later, I did a tour of Canada, starting in Vancouver and ending up in Halifax, all inside of 10 days. <sighs> that, that's a tour. And that's keeping it rushing like at hop, the top hop in a car lungs. and pull over, do a card trick, and then keep going to do another card. <laughs> that's, that's, exactly. that's, that's the same a... old card trick. Too. <laughs> but uh, no, it, it is really astonishing that I found out uh, in doing that tour. I was bringing in people in, in, uh, in, in Calgary, for example. I brought in people from all over that province. Uh, for, and some of them had come long distances uh, to be uh, present at one of my presentations. And, and in case anybody wasn't aware, you are talking to a native son of Canada. Yes. Who lives in Florida now. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so so the, without a built-in skeptics community, to me, when I think back at the history of this, specifically coming from a magic background, uh, the first people I think of are Houdini and Thurston and yes. others who went that route. What impact did they have? Because it seems like you saw a good thing and went, I'm never going to stop. I'm going to spend the rest of my life going down this road. Oh, one thing I must mention to you, Thurston was quite religious. He actually was. And he, he, he didn't do it on stage, but he did declare his firm belief in the afterlife and whatnot. So, but Houdini, Houdini really flew at them. And he, 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 he took all the seances apart, literally right in front of the audience. And he did a wonderful job of it. But he wasn't very well educated, you know. He didn't have much formal schooling. And uh, Walter B. Gibson, do you know that name? I do know that name. Walter B. Gibson is the man who created the shadow. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> and it, you remember that program? No. For the younger people, before you Under 100 here, so they wouldn't remember that. Before YouTube, before TV, before movies, uh, there was radio, and they did radio oh, yeah. materials, and Shadow was fantastic. Oh, yes. And uh, Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man of our town. Oh, yes. I, I, my brother and I used to sit right in front of the radio, staring into the speaker like fools with the, with the cloth over it like that. <laughs> And looking at it as if it were a movie or something. And then came TV. Ah, oh, what an improvement that is. <laughs> so so, so you, were, you were aware of Houdini debunking the mediums. Oh, yes. And, and he would use the term. I mean, debunking came oh, up yes, all the time, yes. which I think kind of maybe slightly poisoned what a, a view of skepticism is. Yes, yeah, to a certain extent. And he was very rough in his ways, you know. Uh, very effective, very effective. But he could have... He could have uh, earned more by throwing out oats instead of sand. Let's put it that way. So when did you first become a conjurer? I, I've forgotten how big I was now. Uh, no, I guess it was way I, <laughs> I first saw a conjurer in my local neighborhood when I lived in, uh, in Toronto. That's the way you say Toronto if you're from Toronto. And um, I rather liked what I saw, and I even made up a costume with my mother's help, and I did some terrible stuff. Oh, my, I, I'm glad I don't have any record of that, and I'm glad they didn't have video recorders in those days, and they certainly didn't. But uh, I, got, I got to see something. First of all, I, I gotta explain something, a little bit of background here, very briefly. Uh, I was one of those child prodigy things, and not a happy 
existence, believe me, because in grade school, I was actually, the school board had a meeting, and they decided that I would be excused from coming to classes because I fell asleep in class. And that really disturbs teachers when you're snoring, you know, especially if you've stayed up all night learning the lesson. But uh, I, I got a special permit, a little beige card about so big, which I lost only a few years ago. Can you imagine? With my name on it, not the name James Randy, but Randall James Hamilton Zwingi. How about that for a name? That's what I was actually christened as. Uh, or dubbed. Let's that, that's a weighty name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. My parents were carried away, obviously. And they included all of their friends in that uh, to make sure they, they weren't that they were recognized. But, uh, that Hamilton guy was just somebody they owed money to, so they <laughs> threw it How the did name. you know? I, well, maybe you knew him. So I, I tell you one, one way I, I knew, uh, I lied, uh, but for those who aren't aware, we're not gonna have a massive amount of time, and there's a ton of stuff to get to. I mean, I could sit here and talk for hours. If you're not aware, there's already one documentary of his life available on Netflix right now called An Honest Liar. I think there should be three. Um, so and whatever we miss tonight, well, we'll do again some other time. Yeah, oh yeah, of course. I'm sorry. I, I get carried away. Yeah, you know how it is. Uh, no. My I, audience. <laughs> I, I just didn't want them to think that, uh, that we were going to condense your entire, entire life into 40 minutes because there's well, too much. But uh, The Anonymous Liar is a documentary which you can see on Netflix, for, for one thing. Uh, do look it up. I think you'll find it uh, moderately interesting and... Uh, we, we don't get paid for it or anything like that, but I hope that you will look for An Honest Liar on Netflix, okay? Got it. So now the conjuring thing, you, you, you use that label, and I don't think we no, need to argue about Conjuring is the correct term. We're not magicians. We don't do magic. No, we do what is apparently magic. And the conjuring word is much better. It's very much a UK word, but conjuring, I'm a conjurer. I am not a magician. I don't like to be referred to as a magician. I'm in the magic trade, so to speak. Uh, I pretend to be a magician on stage, but I don't do real magic. Do you? I don't, I don't, as far as I'm aware. There's the old quote that a magician is an actor playing a magician. And playing the part of a magician, yeah. yes, of course. I love conjurer. Do you, do you have any way to, de to, to prove that you actually are a conjurer? Uh, yes, I think I might come up with something. Do, do you think maybe, we, <laughs> could we persuade him to, to show us that in fact he oh, is wow. one of the greatest conjurers? Oh, goodness. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Okay, I, um, I would like to have two gentlemen uh, join me on the stage. Uh, any two moderately large gentlemen would join me on the stage. There's stairs on each end, I believe. Yes, there's one coming up. Uh, uh, oh. You don't have to hold up your hand, just go on. So look, it looks like you've got two on that side. Oh, two on, all right, I've already got two. Sorry. Sorry, we already got you. Thank you. Come up, gentlemen. How do you do, sir? What is your name? My name's Drew. Drew? Yes. I knew that. <laughs> Sheldon. Sheldon, I knew that too. Okay, Drew over here and Sheldon over here, if you please. Now, uh, oh, I, this is an awkward question, I'm sorry, but do either one of you gentlemen have a piece of rope about that long? No? Oh, well, let me see. That, look at that. I have a piece embedded in my shirt here. By a strange and somewhat contrived coincidence. Now, come closer. I don't bite, not much. Hold on to that end, that's your end. Sounds good. You hold on to that end? I do. That's your end. Oh, I want you to test the rope. That means tug on it, oh, both hands, come on. You got two hands, that's each right. one, there you go. All right, so there's no trap doors or anything like that? No, there's no trap door in this I'm, I'm, I like, I like, like guys, like, he falls for the stuff very easily. You can let go now, it's my rope after all. Okay, now I am going to, wait a minute, just, I'll just pull the sleeves up, I don't have to roll them up. All right, skinny arms, and a cheap wristwatch. <laughs> Nothing else to see. Now, I'm gonna ask you to take this piece of rope and tie my hands together, one on top of the other, so that I cannot possibly escape. Hold on to that end, that's it. You hold on to your end over here, both hands. Yeah. Both hands, <laughs> that's it. Pull on it very tightly now. Oh, the pain. <laughs> That's the acting part. 
All right, now bring it around on top and tie the other hand on top. Each get an end again and pull on it. No, 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 pull on it. I mean tight. Come on, that's not pull. That's it. Now, put your finger on the knot. Put another knot on top of that. Okay. Tight. My finger's stuck. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay, there we go. Now, have you got enough room for another knot? Uh, yeah, we can. Why not? Same price. <laughs> All right. Now, try to pull my hands apart. No, not my arms. But <laughs> okay, you happy? Yeah. All right. Now I want. Uh, oh, we have a. Did we have a chair here or something like? Uh, could you move the the? The water. Here? Yes. Would you mind? Yeah. Yes. He's the water mover. He he does this, this kind of thing. Uh, and take the phone off there and all that stuff. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to sit right here. <laughs> and try to start. Oh no no not yet not yet. <laughs> and there we are, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you very much, Thank you. Uh, that, that's a little thing I developed by copying some other magicians. But uh, no, actually, that's my own version of that particular trick. And, you need some water after your uh, yes. Oh, yeah, I need that. Activity. Yes, thank you very much. I thought it was gin. Oh, well. <laughs> We're not supposed to tell him that. So, there was a story that you were going to tell me about getting fired from a radio station or something? Yes, I was... Uh, I had a radio program in 1967, 68 <coughs> in New York City. Um, I was living... <coughs> I'm overcome with emotion when I talk about being fired. <laughs> Uh -huh. Sure, that's water. Uh, yes, I had this very, I think, very interesting, and millions of people around the United States heard it. Uh, it was on a 100,000-watt station, which in those days covered, covered the whole country and lots of Canada. I had lots of fans in Canada as well. The program only lasted for two years for a strange reason. What we did was we, we had a panel show, and from midnight until 5 in the morning, we would sit up and discuss various paranormal, so-called paranormal uh, events and whatnot, and other claims of treasure finders and whatnot, and dowsing sticks. And um, the program went very well for two years, and I even got to visit uh, parts in South America and I mean, do research and make recordings. And um, then one day, <laughs> day when I went, I lived out in New Jersey and I had to drive uh, 50 miles into New York City, uh, and I did that uh, five nights a week. And uh, one night I got back home to Rumson, New Jersey, where I lived at that time, and the phone was ringing as I walked in the door. Now, uh, this is eight o'clock in the morning or so, you see. And uh, so I answered the phone, who could be calling at this hour? And it was the program manager back at the station. And I said, what's up? He said, I don't know what it is, but they told me to get you back into the city right away. So I went right back into the car <laughs> and drove back into the city, wondering what the heck could this be? Well, when I got there, most of the management of WOR radio, hey, I'm an FM, was uh, sitting in the conference room looking very serious. And uh, I said, what's up? And one of the gentlemen there stood up and said, last night on your radio program, you called Jesus Christ a religious nut. <laughs> I said, no, I didn't. And then they played me the part from the program the night before. And right after going on air, I was right on Times Square, just a block away from Times Square, but at a 24 Floyd building. And... Uh, I had looked out of the window and I saw some reveling going on in Times Square. And when I got on the air a few minutes later, I said, you know, I see them carrying on the parties and the whole thing down in Times Square tonight for some reason or other. You know, if Jesus Christ were to come back as he promised and promised and promised for so many yeah, centuries now, um, I'll bet if he carried a sign saying, I'm Jesus Christ and I've come back, they'd lock him up as a religious nut. 
And the people around the table all said, yeah, you're probably right, you're probably right. And we went right on with other subjects. That's how it got said. But that letter had a red seal on it from the Archdiocese of New York, Cardinal Spellman. Ooh. And when I saw this, I thought, oh, I think I'm screwed. Yeah. That's what I thought at the moment. And I was right. They said, you have to go on the air tonight at midnight sharp and make a long apology. We've written it out for you. They've written out my apology to Cardinal Spellman. And I said, but that's not what I said. We know that's not what you said. But everyone thinks, and certainly Cardinal Spellman thinks that that's what you said. And I said, no, I can't do that. That would be a lie. I was fired. And I never went back to WOR radio. Oh, no. AM and FM. And we're all the better for it. I think I would have gone on there and said, I'm very, very sorry that Cardinal Spellman can't understand common English. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't get a chance to go back and say that. Because that's the exact same sort of thing that I've heard coming out of the mouths of preachers as well when they're oh, yes. you know, reveling about the problems in the world and society. Oh, yes. At some point, though, you... I mean, they, well, wow. So, so do we go to exposing Peter Popoff? Do we go to... Project Alpha. Would you say exposing Peter Popoff in a nice way? Well, <laughs> I mean, there's exposing and there's exposing, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I plead innocence. Uh, yes, you were. Well, let's, let's do Popoff. Do Popoff. Okay, Peter Popoff. How many of us here know Peter Popoff, who he is? Oh, my God, look at this. I mean, not my God, no. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> look at that. Well, uh, Peter Popoff and I have never been very friendly, let's put it that way, to say the least, because uh, on the Johnny Carson show, I, I did uh, 33, I think, altogether, uh, Johnny Carson shows in my time, and uh, Johnny and I got along very well. Every time I walked into the office, they said, oh, we're going to be okay tonight, because I could hold an audience, and uh, I think I still can. See? Look at this. <laughs> and... Uh, <clears throat> uh, I exposed Johnny Carson, uh, pardon me, I exposed Johnny Carson, I'll be all right, keep your seats, I'm going to be all okay, right. yes, I exposed uh, Reverend Popoff uh, on the Johnny Carson show so effectively that uh, <laughs> as the program closed that night, and uh, it, 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 that afternoon I should say, because they did it in the show in the afternoon, taped it in the afternoon, uh, Fred de Cordova, the producer, came over to the table and Johnny and I were sitting there chatting and the audience was leaving the theater and uh, de Cordova looked down and he said, we're going to get letters. <laughs> and John looked up and said, yes, Fred, and you're going to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> and de Cordova just sighed mightily, but the mail that poured in was huge. And guess what the mail said? They supported Peter Popoff, not me. There were only a few letters there that said Randy did a good job of exposing this, this fake. But no, they were for Peter Popoff because the believers are really, they're very set in their way. And it's very hard to talk about it. It's something we, we found out over and over again when, when the James Randy Educational Foundation has gone on to test claims of the paranormal. Oh, yes. Um, the, as we point out, the goal is not to debunk. But on some occasions, you do actually demonstrate fraudulent behavior or, or something oh, like yes. that, and people will still double down. They, they, these are cherished beliefs. Oh, I think yeah. one, one of my favorite things, which may not be accurate, so for those who don't know, Peter Popoff was a, a televangelist who would get messages from God. And, you know, so-and-so from 128th Street, uh, God is healing your cancer. Uh, turns out God sounds a lot like his wife. Yes, because she was backstage in a concealed room, and she had already been through the audience, and the audience always got there two hours before to make sure they didn't miss a precious word of Dr. Doctor, listen to me, uh, Reverend Popoff. And Reverend Dr. Emperor, whatever. Emperor, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, very true. And, uh, but they didn't want to miss anything, so they got there very, very early. And Mrs. Popoff would go down the aisle, and she'd say, good evening, I'm Mrs. Popoff. Uh, are you here to see Reverend Papa and to be healed? And they would say, yes, well, I have a very bad thing in my lower back, in your lower back. Oh, I know how painful that can be. Well, you'll talk to Reverend Papa later on. And the assistant who was with her would make a note. 
seat so and so and you know, making notes. And that would all be taken backstage and she would sit at a microphone and this is what we would hear. I had the recording of it. Uh, Hello, Petey, can you hear me? And this is what he's hearing through his earpiece, you see, in the audience, walking around. He doesn't respond to her because she's speaking to him over the earpiece. And it continues on, this is your wife. If you can't hear me, you're in deep shit. <laughs> and and uh, other things that I, I wouldn't repeat in front of this audience. She, she was awful. In, oh, in some she, of the things that she oh, said. And, and she had a woman friend with her all the time, and they would laugh at some of the terrible injuries and things that people had. I, I, I won't specify them. It would really disgust you. But really, open wounds and things like that of people in the audience who are there to be healed. And they're not going to be healed by any means. But they would be laughing. Look at that man. He's only got three fingers kind of thing, you know. And they thought that was very humorous because it was making them money. And the money poured in and poured in. I remember watching out of the back window when he came to Fort Lauderdale, where I live now. And uh, they were throwing suitcases full of money into the back of the limousine. Limousine, of course, he couldn't use anything less than a limousine. But big suitcase, and when we went out to inspect it, the, the lot at the back, we found the crumpled up and torn letters of the people who were pleading for prayers and whatnot, with the addresses torn out, you see, and the first name, that's all. That's what they kept, but they didn't keep the whole letter. And some of them, there were dollar bills, because there was so much money coming in at such a rate that they didn't care that much. Leave, leave the singles behind. And it, Popoff's still on the air, by the way. He is. He's, he, he's kind of back and... He's on I, very I often, minor stations, but uh, he's back. I, I often wonder, in cases like this where somebody has been so clearly exposed, yeah. why there isn't more action on behalf of governments with bunko type things to, to go well, after. You can't get, now we used to have Claude Pepper was a senator in the United States and he was after these people and he did get some of them sent to prison of all things. But as soon as he died, all the rest of the, 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 the congressmen and whatnot, they all decided, oh, I, won't, I don't want to touch that. I don't want to touch that. They've got other things to talk about. But that is something that they should be dealing with. It hurts a lot of people and causes many of them to die. And it's not just, you know, the realms of, of faith healers because you, you've been, I mean, obviously the pop-off thing is a big deal, but you, you also spearheaded uh, Project Alpha. Yes. Um, Project Alpha, yeah. That, that was one of our great victories. I, uh, I, I found two young fellows who wrote me separately from different parts of the country and I got the first letter and I put it, I wrote a note in response, thank you very much and I may do it someday. He wanted to be organized uh, with a, with a um, helpmate to go into a lab, a real scientific lab where they believed in all this paranormal, uh, what's the expression, crap. <laughs> and uh, he, they wanted to deceive the scientists, you see, to show that they could be deceived. And I got a second letter a few months after that from another fellow, and I put the two letters together and I said, well, it's time for Project Alpha. And I wrote to the, the kids and I said, uh, yes, I'd, I'd want you to, to meet and uh, see if you get along together. They, they merged very, very well, and each one complimented the other in different ways. And one of them is now known as Banachek. That's his professional name. And he's a wonderful mentalist. Oh, you have no idea. Uh, he's, uh, have you ever seen Banachek? Yes. Oh, yes. Well, he does fantastic things. Largely do the, well, I taught him, but uh, I, I don't <laughs> want to take too much credit for that. Just that much. Uh, but Banachek is a professional mentalist now. Uh, the other fellow, Michael, has not uh, taken up the trade, but he's, he's got a good a good well-paying job, so we're happy for that. But the Alpha Kids went into the lab, and I have a full report of it, and a, and a big chapter in the upcoming book on the Alpha Kids, the Alpha Project, I call it. And uh, they fooled these parapsychologists so easily. It was just incredible. Uh, quick example. Uh, Steve was wearing a black sweater, and Mike looked at him and said, oh, 
that's good. Okay, let me take a picture. Now, this is in days of the first Polaroid cameras when you could make a double exposure. Usually you made it inadvertently, but you could make a double exposure. Uh, so he took a picture of, of Steve standing like this with this black sweater on. And of course, that is a black area in the photograph. And then he, he took a picture of some holy icon or other, click, took that. And the two of them were a double exposure now in the Polaroid camera. And they showed that to the scientist and they said, now we got something. This is the scientist talking. Down we got something. And they went into another room and just laughed. They said they couldn't control the laughter. Now, it was funny at the time. But then, when it came to the time when it was going to be revealed, and I was going to reveal it for Time magazine, which I did, uh, they started to back down. They said, you know, uh, Dr. Phillips is, is really, is rather innocent about this whole thing. Yes, but if we don't reveal that he made a very big mistake, and those scientists spent millions in government money on the research that they did, and wrote books on it and such, I said, we, we've wasted our time, and we revealed it on Time magazine. I think there was a couple key points. Um, one of the things is that they both had instructions that if at any time... Yeah, oh yes. Somebody said, are you using trickery to do this? That's they are right. to come clean. Nobody even asked. No, they never got asked. And I would write to Phillips and say, ask the kids, ask the kids if they're So famous. while they're being tested, you are communicating with the testers. That's right. Oh, basically yeah. saying, here's the steps you need to take. Yeah, and I would say things in the letters like, if they ever do this, describe me something they've just done. You see, I always look at the so-and-so and such and give him the solution to the thing. But he threw, no, that was, that's Randy. That's they, Randy. What they does he know? You. Now, you've done this. Many times, when yes. Uri Geller was coming on Carson, oh, yes. you gave instructions on this. I, I remember uh, a test of a gentleman that I saw on, um, that's incredible? Yes, uh, that, I call it a, that's an edible. <laughs> that's all right. Why is it, and I think maybe, I, I hope, I'm optimistic that this has changed, conjurers, people in the magic community, are at least one recognizable class of experts in deception. Oh yes, they know what's happening. They're the experts. Why is it so difficult to get the investigators to make use of the experts in deception? Because we haven't got doctor or professor in front of our names. That's it. They say, where was Randy educated anyway? Uh, he only got a high school education. <laughs> yeah, a lot of help he's gonna be. He'll fool the pants off you. In a nice way. Yes. So one of the things is, you and I are aware, and others have talked about it, as I, I remember times when I would perform magic, when I was still a fundamentalist Christian, and people would attribute, oh, you've got satanic powers and all that, and it would, it would terrify me and frustrate me to the point where, on one occasion, I would even show them exactly how I did this. Now, this is a card trick that I'd practiced forever, and I did it, and they thought I was using dark power to do it, and I'm, I'm a fundamentalist Christian kid. I don't want you thinking the devil's working through me. So I decided I would show them exactly how the trick was done. I kid you not, no sooner had I shown them, and they said, that's not what you did the first time. Exactly. That's always the answer. Or, or that, that's what you're saying now yeah. kind of thing. But if I can fool you this way, why would I ever, you know, go exactly. to the dark energies? Exactly. I don't know. It's uh, in, the, in, the, in the magic community, the conjuring community, there's a great pool of expertise. Is it being tapped more now for research than it was earlier? No, no, it, it, it's, it's frightening, but it isn't. Because more money is going into it, as of just a matter of seven or eight months ago, more money has been put into the paranormal research uh, in the United States. And uh, I found out about this in a very strange way, but I- Were you watching the History Channel where it's all- <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I had discovered, and uh, my new book, <clears throat> I'm sure we'll all be buying copies, right? The 11th book from Yeah, this the book. 11th book. Yeah, I've been, I've been preaching this sort of thing for 11 books for, and that's a lot of books on a shelf, I can tell you that. But uh, it's, it, it just, well, with many people, oh, the letters of recommendation I've got, and I must say that when we show the film An Honest Liar, uh, my partner Davey and I, we often go to the showings uh, because we're both in the film. And uh, 
we get the usual Q&A, questions and answers, and then the audience leaves, but there are invariably six to eight people or so who will stay behind and they'll come up to the foot of the stage afterwards with tears coming down their faces. And they'll look up at you and they'll say, you made a big change in my life. You can't buy that. There's no price you can pay to get somebody to say that and say it and really mean it genuinely. With the tears coming down their faces, they'll hold, they'll hold our hands and just say, up until I saw the, the movie that you just made, the, the documentary, uh, I had believed in all of this sort of thing, but you were very convincing, and, and I thank you very much for, for this revelation. And you think, if only I could have reached them earlier, because the money's all gone, you know. Some of them go bankrupt. They sell the house, they do... They, you would not believe what people will do to get enough money to send to the faith healers and the preachers. It's, it's incredible. There's another thing, just... If there's anybody who loves uh, making sure that they're clear to the point that they'll talk for hours, it's me. Um, so when we talk about the fact that conjurers are one of the categories of people who would be experts in deception, I don't want to give the false impression that magicians themselves are not subject to all sorts of irrational beliefs. Very true. Uh, we were speaking earlier both about uh, Doug Henning. Oh, yes. Who may well still be alive you today. you remember Doug Henning? Oh, well, yes. And, and Doug, as, as I just said, Doug Henning fell for the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, hook, line, and sinker. He, he gave fantastic amounts of money to him. And uh, it eventually killed Doug because they told him that he could be healed through the Maharishi's power, and Doug just died. He died at a very early age. And I have, I have a letter from Doug, which is in my scrapbook. And I, I took it out of the scrapbook because I put it in another book. I didn't want it to be in among the rest of it. And Doug told me his closing sentence. He said, I, I have, now I believe discovered how to do real levitation, and I can't wait to show you. And he died about six weeks after that. And that's the saddest letter I ever received in my life. And he was thanking me for having tried to put him on the right track, but no, I know the Maharishi is the real thing. The Maharishi died a short time after that as well. But the movement is still going. The Maharishi Mahesh Yogi is very powerful all over India. And he has ashrams every place, like Sai Baba. Do you remember yes. Sai Baba? And, uh, well, anyway. We have well, I, you know, I've talked on, on my show and in different things about um, specifically the religious as aspect where people forego medical treatment and instead leave it up to God and, and seek prayer. And we know that that's killing people. We hear about it all the time. It's not the only thing, it, not just whatever modern religion you pick. It goes beyond that. And there are people who, when you and others have gone after the air quotes psychics, uh, their big question is, come on, why bother? It's all fun. It's not hurting anybody. You know, can't you, can't you just let people keep their beliefs? Wait till they see some of those weeping people at the foot of this age saying, you've made a big difference in my life. Wow. That, and as I say, you cannot buy that. You'll never be able to buy that. And <clears throat> these people are just so sad. Sometimes I, I spend a good hour or so with some of them, and they're, they're just looking at you saying, I, I don't know what I would have done had you not come along. And that, that makes you <clears throat> feel responsibility. That just makes you shiver all over. It's terrible, really. So we're in, in a few minutes. In, thank you. In a few minutes, we're going to take a few questions. We don't have a lot of time for questions, and there'll be an intermission after the questions uh, before we get on the rest of the show. Maybe, maybe five, six, seven questions. We're not completely sure, but there's mics set up at either side. Um, oddly enough, all, all of our time is just flying by, and I only have, what, 43, 45 more bullet points to go on, okay. <laughs> on potential topics here? Uh, this is, this is something that, that I want to get your take on. As somebody uh, 
who's lived through it all and done it all and been, and been the spearhead for many of this. I look at the internet and the access to information that we have now. Oh, yes. And I am absolutely elated and gutted at, at the, the same, same time. time. Yes. Yeah, that, I feel that way I have for years now because the truth is in there and the nonsense is in there as well. We have better access to information. We have access to more information. You would think that this would be a boon for skepticism and rational thought. Yeah, oh yes. Unfortunately, one of the problems is, who do you listen to? Which, anybody can put on a lab coat, anybody can create a web page that looks impressive. That's right. That's right. There's fake news, which we're all hearing about all the time now. Uh, spare me. Alternative facts. Uh, which I classify alongside alternative medicine, you know. Oh, yes. Uh, how optimistic are you, and w do you think that we're going to get to a point where we're not creating this pool of information that is also simultaneously poisoning us? Yeah. I wish I had a good answer to that. I really wish. But the Internet can be our best friend, and it can be our worst enemy. You've got to be very careful of it. And uh, I I'm happy for the Internet because it has enabled us to get the words out, but they're beating us at it. Yeah. Oh, I have a, a short statement I would like to read, if I may. It, sort of a summary, uh, and uh, a little bit, okay. Let me just state this. My, this, this is from my, my forthcoming book. My personal heroes are few, but they're very large. Carl Sagan was a good friend. Isaac Asimov was close to me in many ways. Martin Gardner was a minor god of mine. If you don't know anything about Martin Gardner, look him up. Richard Feynman and I exchanged many useful thoughts over the years. In the UK, Sir John Maddox was my good friend, and Richard Dawkins has supported me, and you folks know Richard Dawkins, and the James Randi Educational Foundation in many ways, but our heroes should be far more abundant. Now, lest you get any notion that this dependence upon nonsense is new to this generation. Let me read you a quotation. 59 wise words written by Thomas Carlyle, Scottish philosopher, satirical writer, essayist, and teacher, a prominent historian who in the year 1881, even I wasn't alive then, that's much more than a century ago, but nonsense has been with us for a very long time. Thomas Carlyle wrote, and I quote, heroes have gone out, Quacks have come in. The reign of quacks has not ended with the 19th century. The scepter is held with a fervor grasp. The empire has a wider boundary. We are all the slaves of quackery in one shape or another. One portion of our being is always playing the successful quack to the other. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are now, it seems, reliving a very bad aspect of our own history. We should learn from that and we should put an end to it. And for a very time, kind attention to my words, I thank you sincerely. There's a... I know there's folks going to line up for questions. Um, you went after homeopathy at one point. Oh, yes. Gladly and, and, and vigorously. It's one of the many things that I find in this new age rhymes with sewage, oh, woo yeah. stuff, uh, to, yes. to quote you, Indeed. that people just look at and say, oh, there's, it's no big deal, you know, what, what's it hurting? Well, you know, I, I guess if you had plenty of water, it's not hurting too much. Well, homeopathy is based upon an idea uh, from a quack uh, from, uh, many, many years ago, uh, who came up with the idea that if you dilute a medicine down to, uh, listen to this, Listen to the figures now. Literally tens of billions of parts of water to one part of medicine. There's a thing called Avogadro's limit. And at that limit, it means there is either only one molecule or atom of the original substance left, or there are none whatsoever. That is so far beyond Avogadro's limit that in all of the pills that you buy that are labeled homeopathic or liquid medicines like Zycam and a few other things like that. Very popular on all pharmacist shops. You'll find them in every country. You are getting zero doses of medicine. 
I don't mean small doses. I mean zero doses of medicine. There is none of the original molecule or atom in that was mixed into the substance years ago. It's like filling this auditorium, literally this auditorium, and dissolving one aspirin at 325 milligrams in it, stirring it up, and then taking a few drops of that and throwing it into another tank at the same size. Uh, come on. Homeopathy consists of zero doses of, of medication. Zero. It's, it's one of those things. So from the science point of it, it seems obvious. And yet when you, when you hear talk about they've got special methods, oh, we need to shake it this way and shake it that way. And, ten times this and way. Da, and literally, da, 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 and ten da, da. times that way. And it's because... It's because the, the, the two things that are the foundations of it are that like cures like, which is something that nobody's ever demonstrated other than it sounds interesting. You know, let's, hey, this, this will cause you to go to sleep, so we'll use it to cure insomnia. Uh, but the other, the other aspect of this is that water has a memory. You know, a, a memory. Yeah. And I, somebody pointed out that it doesn't seem to remember all the poop that's been in it. Yes, that's very true, too. Yeah, and other substances we won't get but into. But I mean, if water had a memory, you'd be able to take something like this, and it would just stay there. But that can't be but done. That can't be done, because no, no. water no, doesn't have a memory. Uh, there's a question over on this side. We'll go ahead and get started and take some questions. Thanks for waiting. Yeah, hi. Um, many years ago, uh, you were very successful in getting rid of one charlatan by the name of Yuri Geller, who... Uri, uh, it's the right pronunciation. Always call the devil by his right name. <laughs> Uri. Uri Geller, yes. I, I, now, I've, I've noticed, uh, being a magician myself, uh, he's been trying to insinuate himself into the magic community in the last couple of years. Yes. Uh, but I was just wondering if you had any further meetings with him in the last little while? Uh, well, not, not recently, but I found some very interesting news. He and his entire family suddenly, a matter of a few months ago, moved back to Israel. And I have two very good Israeli friends who both wrote me up on the internet within an hour of one another saying, it's in all the news, he's living back in Israel, and we don't, neither one of us can figure out why, because no one in Israel believes his stories. <laughs> they laugh at, at Uri Geller, they make jokes about Uri Geller, they know he's a phony. Uh, what is he doing back in Israel? And I'd like to know the answer to that too, because he gave up a very, very expensive home in England, a, a whole estate, and he just suddenly moved out. And, he, and the whole family is back in Israel. If any yeah. of you know the answer, see me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I'd like to I state for the record, I'm not making any statements about Uri Geller because I don't have enough money for him to come after me with his lawyers. Uh, so it just wouldn't... Oh, he has sued me 20 times over the years. 20 times, never won a penny. Never won a penny, but he had to pay out some huge fines of a couple of hundred thousand dollars because he didn't pay uh, up his lawyers and whatnot. So he, 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 wouldn't need the, money on me. he wouldn't need the money if he'd learned how to unbend those spoons. That's true. That's very true. Is there a question over on that side? Uh, yeah, I was wondering if there are any uh, interesting challenge or attempts at the Million Dollar Challenge recently. Oh, yes, many. But we can't talk about them because, we, you see, if we, we warn them, then they run for the woods. And we want them to sit still on a stage and be questioned. You, you've got to face up to the... But there are interesting claims coming, I can assure you. Uh, the, uh, you know, offering money for something as stupid as what we're doing is, is embarrassing. It is embarrassing to me, I must say, personally, to see these people coming out on the stage at, at any of the meetings that we hold for the James Randi Educational Foundation, which we do from time to time, and uh, they come out on stage and they are the most amazed of all that the thing failed. But then when we talked to them after it, we found out how they did the test, and they made excuses all the way through the test. Oh, it didn't work that time, but it usually works much better. Uh, they, they, they don't know what they're doing. They're not scientific, they're not logical, they're not rational, uh, and, and logical about the thing at all. We so, we'd spoken earlier um, about Ray Hyman. Ray Hyman? Um, well, and, and others, where I, I have this question, that, because... I'm going to uh, attempt to read minds, but I'm not convinced that I can actually read minds all the time. And yet we see these people yes. who may begin as frauds, but then become convinced that they have some real ability. Yes. 
The, the reason I think that happens is because they were never given the tools of skepticism and critical thinking to, to not, that, not that it's going to make you immune. I guarantee you, all of you are going to be fooled and make foolish, uh, establish foolish yes. beliefs, no matter how skeptical you try to be. The, the goal is to minimize that and minimize the damage and to be open to, to, to interact with others. They tend to remember when they hit the right answer. Yes. And they preach it to everybody and they can't stop talking about it. But they forgot about the 40 times in between when they missed altogether. Yeah. Selective thinking. On this side. Uh, hi, I'd like to thank you guys for coming here. It was, uh, it's been a great evening so far. Uh, I'd like to, when I was a kid, I first learned, started learning magic tricks and it, I think it uh, affected my life. What do you guys think about uh, encouraging kids to take part in magic? and uh, um, learn tricks in order to uh, promote skepticism? Well, I, I think it's a good idea myself, uh, but we should refer to it as conjuring, you see, because it, it isn't really magic, remember that. And teach the kids that, too. And teach them also to have a good sense of what they should be saying and not saying. And if they had an, a magic show was saying, what you've seen is a series of tricks. I'm very happy to have your applause, and I thank you for inviting me. Something like that, where they acknowledge that they haven't really done miracles. That's I, important. I think I, I'm, I'm in complete agreement. I don't know too much to add other than that. I think there's a distinction between um, finding and developing a passion for conjuring magical arts you know, as a performance, as a, a passion yours, and then using it as a teaching tool. I think that there's a, a great opportunity to teach critical thinking skills in every school and to make use of conjuring tricks and things like that um, as a tool for that. But I don't necessarily want to, you know, we need to, I, from, from the standpoint of the magic community, from what I think of that conjuring community, I want to find new blood to come in and do the sort of shows that I love and for that, you have to find a passion. So there's two different things. There's one is use it as a tool to educate. Uh, and one of the big things which I stress over and over is I, I've done a lecture or two Thank you. On, uh, on magic and skepticism. And one of the key things is that people will come up after I've done a particular effect and they'll say, how'd you do that? And I don't tell them. And I, there's, there's a reason I don't tell them, and it has absolutely nothing to do with uh, a conjurer's code or keeping the secret or anything like that. Uh, it's very simple. Because if I tell you exactly how I did it, you now know how I did it. And now you think that you know how it's done. And those two things are very different. Because oh, yes. the way he does it might be completely different. If he can convince you that he's not using the trick that you learned from me, yeah. He may be able to convince you that he is, in fact, a wizard, and, which he is. And, and, <laughs> and, and your performance is forgotten about. Do I have time to? Absolutely. You have as much time as, as you want. We'll cut into everything. Oh, I don't, don't ever say that to me. Well, <laughs> that, that's very dangerous talk. The guy uh, who talks more than anybody is telling you, please, please. Yeah, could we have the house lights up? Would that be uh, difficult to ask for? Ah, oh, look at that. A miracle. I just asked that. And it, yeah, Let there no be light. No question of that. Now, I must, uh, must uh, tell my audience this, that uh, earlier I spoke to a young lady uh, that I met as she was coming in to this audience, and she's someplace in the audience. Where are you? Uh, there you are. Okay, in the balcony, so we can see you better. Now, I'm going to, you don't have to come down or anything. I'm just uh, going to step over to the board here for a minute. Whoops, <laughs> sorry. I'll be okay. <laughs> I think. All right. Now, I asked this young lady, uh, there, it was a real estate book, I believe, was it? I think it's like a Visit Canada. Uh, what, I'm sorry? Visit Canada Tourist Guide type book. Oh, okay, all right. And I asked you uh, to name a, a page, uh, right, any number. I gave you the number of pages of the book. And I asked you to turn to that page, and I stood well away from you, and your companion there watched me carefully, and I had my back turned to the table, and there was nobody looking over your shoulder or anything like that. I simply asked you to look away from the page and run your finger around like this and stop any place at all. And I, the only provision I made was, I said, don't take a word like but or and or something like that. They're very dull words. Uh, but I asked you to take some other word. 
from there that would be significant, okay? And uh, now I, I must tell you, I must admit to my experience in doing this demonstration is no one ever takes a five or six letter word. They always take 20 letter words if they can find them. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I, I'm gonna make an attempt. I'm gonna step over to the board here and uh, I'd, I'll turn away from you so that I don't pick up any body clues because if I'm doing it correctly, you'll be going <laughs> And if I'm doing it wrongly, you'll be going <laughs> like this, you see. So I won't look at you at all, but I'm gonna step over to the board here. Now, I could not have seen the word that you rested your finger on, right? And uh, you do remember the word, though. See, if, if you don't remember the word, I say, the word was so-and-so, and she says, I don't know, I forgot. I really hate that, you see, but you do remember the word. Okay, and have you told your companion? What the, okay, all right. Ah, I made it. That's the tar toughest part of the whole trick is getting the top off. <laughs> now, I'm gonna stand here. Okay. Uh, uh, don't say anything, please, and don't react in any way at all. Uh, this doesn't make any sense so far. Uh, mm. okay. Well, oh goodness! No, no th this is not making any sense. No question of that. Do you know a word that goes like that? I don't help, speak help Canadian. Me. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, wait, there's a bracket over here. Of some kind. Don't tell me if I'm right or wrong now. Oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> mm. No, like this. I'll write it up here again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so forget this one here. Well, I have no idea what a silly word like that could possibly be. It doesn't make any sense to me. Well, just so we'll see. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I, I sort of sense this. Yeah, sure. Uh, at the end of it. Now, you didn't tell anybody what the word was at all. You certainly didn't tell me. That's pretty <laughs> obvious. Uh, well, oh, <laughs> I hate to tell you this, but would you tell me, please, what was the word that you chose in the book by running your finger around on it? What? Canadian. Canadian? Oh, plural. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I put the S at the end then. A voila. Now, this, and, and we're not inclusion at all. We had never met before. I just approached you with your, your gentleman friend there, and I asked if you, and you weren't watched. I had my back to you, and he was watching me, and there was nobody else around who could possibly have seen what happened. It must be a miracle. I, I think I started to believe. <laughs> I've just proven it to myself. No, ladies and gentlemen, this is what we call in the trade, mentalism. This gentleman is, is quite an expert on that subject as well, as you will find out, I'm sure, because you can't stop him. <laughs> but I want you to, to believe this sincerely, I tell you. These sort of things are tricks. They're done purposely to fool people 
but we hope that you take them as entertainment. This is entertain. This happens to be my own particular invention. This particular trick that I do here, and I have six or eight to my credit. I've never published them, and I've never told anyone how this particular one is done. But I want to thank you very much for your very kind attention. It's been such a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Oh, oh my. <laughs> oh, oh. Thank you.